Chapter 8 Self-Preservation Identifying Leg Traps, Cages, and Poison Bait The Feral Woman In the Oxford English Dictionary, the word feral derives from Latin fur, meaning wild beast. In common usage, a feral creature is one who was once wild, then domesticated, and who has reverted back to a natural or untamed state once again. I postulate the feral woman as one who was once in a natural psychic state, that is, in her rightful wild mind, then later captured by whatever turn of events, thereby becoming overly domesticated and deadened in proper instincts. When she has opportunity to return to her original wildest nature, she too easily steps into all manner of traps and poisons. Because her cycles and protective systems have been tampered with, she is at risk in what used to be her natural wild state. No longer weary and alert, she easily becomes prey. There is a specific pattern to the loss of instinct. It is essential to study this pattern, to actually memorize it, so that we can guard the treasures of our basic natures and those of our daughters as well. In the psychic woods, there are many leg traps made of rusted iron that lie just below the leafy green of the forest floor. Psychologically, the same is true of the greater world. There are various lures to which we are susceptible. Relationships, people, and ventures that are tempting. But inside that good-looking bait is something sharpened to a point. Something that kills our spirit as soon as we bite into it. Feral women of all ages and especially the young, have a tremendous drive to compensate for long famines and exiles. They are endangered by excessive and mindless striving toward people and goals that are not nurturing, substantive, or enduring. No matter where they live, or in what time, there are cages waiting always, too small lives into which women can be lured or pushed. If you have ever been captured, if you have ever endured hambre del mar, the starvation of the soul, if you have ever been trapped, and especially if you have a drive to create, it is likely that you have been or are a feral woman. The feral woman is usually extremely hungry for something soulful and often will take any poison disguised on a pointed stick believing it to be the thing for which her soul hungers. Though some feral women veer away from traps at the last moment with only minor losses of fur, far more stumble into them unwittingly, knocked temporarily senseless, while others are broken by them, and still others manage to disentangle themselves and drag themselves off to a cave to nurse the injuries alone. In order to avoid these snares and enticements that are tripped by a woman's time spent in capture and famine, we must be able to see them in advance and sidestep them. We have to redevelop insight and caution. We have to learn to veer. To be able to see the right turns, we have to be able to see the wrong ones. There is what I believe to be the remnants of an old woman's teaching tale that ex explicates the plight of the starved and feral woman. It is variously known by names such as the devil's dancing shoes, the red hot shoes of the devil, and the red shoes. Hans Christian Andersen wrote his rendition of this old tale and titled it with the latter name. Like a true Raconteur, he surrounded the core of the story with much of his own ethnic wit and sensitivity. The following is a Magyar Germanic version of the Red Shoes that my aunt Teresa used to tell us when we were children. One that I use here with her blessing. In her artful way, she always began the tale by saying, Look at your shoes and be thankful they are plain. For one has to live very carefully if one's shoes are too red. The Red Shoes Once there was a poor, motherless child who had no shoes. But the child saved cloth scraps wherever she found them, 
and over time sewed herself a pair of red shoes. They were crude, but she loved them. They made her feel rich, even though her days were spent gathering food in the thorny woods until far past dark. But one day, as she trudged down the road in her rags and her red shoes, a gilded carriage pulled up beside her. Inside was an old woman who told her she was going to take her home and treat her as her own little daughter. So to the wealthy old woman's house they went, and the child's hair was cleaned and combed. She was given pure white undergarments and a fine wool dress and white stockings and shiny black shoes. When the child asked after her old clothes, and especially her red shoes, the old woman said the clothes were so filthy and the shoes so ridiculous that she had thrown them into the fire where they were burnt to ashes. The child was very sad, for even with all the riches surrounding her, the humble red shoes made by her own hands had given her the greatest happiness. Now she was made to sit still at all times, to walk without skipping, and to not speak unless spoken to. But a secret fire began to burn in her heart and she continued to yearn for her old red shoes more than anything. As the child was old enough to be confirmed on the day of the innocence, the old woman took her to an old crippled shoemaker to have a special pair of shoes made for the occasion. In the shoemaker's case, there stood a pair of red shoes made of finest leather that were finer than fine. They practically glowed. So even though red shoes were scandalous for church, the child, who chose only with her hungry heart, picked the red shoes. The old lady's eyesight was so poor she could not see the colour of the shoes and so paid for them. The old shoemaker winked at the child and wrapped the shoes up. The next day, the child, the church members, were agog over the shoes on the child's feet. The red shoes shone like burnished apples, like hearts, like red-washed plums. Everyone stared, even the icons on the wall, even the statues stared disapprovingly at her shoes. But she loved the shoes all the more. So when the point of it intoned, the choir hummed, the organ pumped, the child thought nothing more beautiful than her red shoes. By the end of the day, the old woman had been informed about her ward's red shoes. Never, never wear those red shoes again, the old woman threatened. But the next Sunday, the child couldn't help but choose the red shoes over the black ones, and she and the old woman walked to church as usual. At the door to the church was an old soldier with his arm in a sling. He wore a little jacket and had a red beard. He bowed and asked permission to brush the dust from the child's shoes. The child put out her foot, and he tapped the soles of her shoes with a little wigger jig song that made the soles of her feet itch. Remember to stay for the dance, he smiled and winked at her. Again, everyone looked askance as the, child, as the girl's red shoes. But she so loved the shoes that were bright like crimson, bright like raspberries, bright like pomegranates, that she could hardly think of anything else, hardly hear the service at all. So busy was she turning her feet this way and that, admiring her red shoes, that she forgot to sing. As she and the old woman left the church, the injured shoulder soldier called out, What beautiful dancing shoes! His words made the girl take a few little twirls right there and then. But once her feet had begun to move, they would not stop, and she danced through the flower beds and around the corner of the church until it seemed as though she had lost complete control of herself. She did a gavot and then a shadow and then waltzed by herself through the fields across the way. The old woman's coachman jumped up from his bench and ran after the girl, picked her up and carried her back to the carriage. But the girl's feet in the red shoes were still dancing in the air as though they were still on the ground. The old woman and the coachman tugged and pulled, trying to pry the red shoes off. It was such a sight. All hats askew and kicking legs, but at last the child's feet were calmed. 
Back home, the old woman slammed the red shoes down high on a shelf and warned the girl never to touch them again. But the girl, the girl could not help looking at them and longing for them. To her, they were still the most beautiful things on the face of the earth. Not long after, as fate would have it, the old woman became bedroom, and as soon as the doctors left, the girl crept into the room where the red shoes were kept. She glanced up at them so high on the shelf. Her glance became a glaze, and her gaze became a powerful desire, so much so that the girl took the shoes from the shelf and fastened them on feeling it would do no harm. But as soon as they touched her heels and toes, she was overcome by the urge to dance. And so out the door she danced, and then down the steps, first in a gavit, then a sardar, and then in big darling whir whirling twirls, down in rapid succession. The girl was in her glory and did not realise she was in trouble until she wanted to dance to the left and the shoes insisted on dancing to the right. When she wanted to dance around, the shoes insisted on dancing straight ahead. And as the shoes danced, the girl, rather than the other way around, they danced her right down the road, through the muddy fields and out into the dark and gloomy forest. There, against a tree, was the old soldier with the red beard, his arm in a sling and dressed in his little jacket. Oh my, he said, what beautiful dancing shoes. Terrified, she tried to pull the shoes off, but as much as she tugged, the shoes stayed fast. She hopped on one foot and then the other, trying to take off the shoes, but her one foot on the ground kept dancing even so, and her other foot in the hand did its part of the dancers also. And so dance, and dance, and dance she did. Over highest hills and through the valleys, in the rain and in the snow, in the sunlight, she danced. She danced in the darkest night and through sunrise, and she was still dancing in twilight as well. But it was not good dancing. It was terrible dancing, and there was no rest for her. She danced into a churchyard, and there a spirit of dread would not allow her to enter. The spirit pronounced these words over her. You shall dance in your red shoes until you become like a wrath, like a ghost, till your skin hangs from your bones, till there is nothing left of you but entrails, dancing. You shall dance door to door through all the villages and you shall strike each door three times and when people peer out, they will see you and fear your fate for themselves. Dance, red shoes, you shall dance. The girl begged for mercy, but before she could plead further, her red shoes carried her away. Over the brears she danced, through the streams, over the hedgerows, and on and on, dancing, still dancing, till she came to her old home, and there were mourners. The old woman who had taken her in had died, yet even so she danced on by. And dance she did, as dance she must. In abject exhaustion and horror, she danced into a forest where lived the town's executioner, and the axe on his wall began to tremble as soon as it sensed her coming near. Please, she begged the executioner as she danced by his door, please cut off my shoes to free me from this horrid fate. And the executioner cut through the straps of the red shoes with his axe but still the shoes stayed on her feet. And so she cried to him that her life was worth nothing and that he should cut off her feet. So he cut off her feet and the red shoes with the feet in them kept on dancing through the forest and over the hill and out of sight. And now the girl was a poor cripple and had to find her own way in the world as a servant to others. And she never, ever again wished for red shoes. Brutal loss in fairy tales. It is more than reasonable to ask why there are such brutal episodes in fairy tales. It is a phenomenon based worldwide in mythos and folklore. The gruesome conclusion to this tale is typical of fairy tale endings, wherein the spiritual protagonist is unable to complete 
an attempted transformation. Psychologically, the brutal episode communicates an imperative psychic truth. This truth is so urgent, and yet so easy to disregard by saying, Oh, um, hmm, I do understand, and to then go traipsing off to one's doom anyway. That we are unlikely to heed the alarm if it is stated in lesser terms. In the modern technological world, the brutal episodes of fairy tales have been replaced by images in television commercials, such as those showing a family snapshot with one member blotted out and a trail of blood over the photograph to show what happens when a person drives while drunk or attempting to dissuade people from using illegal drugs by showing an egg bubbling in a frying pan and pointing out that this is what happens to the brain on drugs. The brutal motive is an ancient way of causing the emotive self to pay attention to a very serious message. The psychological truth in the red shoes is that a woman's meaningful life can be pried, threatened, robbed or seduced away from her unless she holds onto or retrieves her basic joy and wild worth. The tale calls our attention to traps and poisons we too easily take unto ourselves when we are caught in a famine of wild soul. Without a firm participation with the wild nature, a woman starves and falls into an obsession of feel betters, leave me alone and love me, please. When she is starved, a woman will take any substitutes offered, including those that, like dead placebos, do absolutely nothing for her, as well as destructive and life-threatening ones that hideously waste her time and talents or expose her life to physical danger. It is a famine of the soul that makes a woman choose things that will cause her to dance madly out of control, then too, too near the executioner's door. So in order to understand this tale further, we have to see how a woman can so drastically lose her way by losing her instinctual and wild life. The way to hold on to what we have, the way to find our way back to the wild feminine, is to see what mistakes a woman so trapped can make. Then we can backtrack and repair. Then we can have reunion. As we shall see, the loss of the handmade red shoes represent the loss of a woman's self-designed life and passionate vitality, and the taking on of too tame a life. This eventually leads to loss of accurate perception, which leads to excess, which leads to loss of the feet, the platform on which we stand, our basis, a deep part of our instinctual nature that supports our freedom. The Red Shoes shows us how a deterioration begins and what state we come to if we make no intervention in our own wildish behalf. Let there be no mistake. When a woman makes efforts to intervene and fight her demon, whatever that demon may be, it is one of the most worthy battles known, both arch archetypically and in consensual re reality. Even though she might, as in the tale, hit ground zero minus five bottom via famine, capture, injured instinct, destructive choices, and all the rest. Remember, at bottom is where the living roots of psyche are. It is there that a woman's wild underpinnings are. At bottom is the best soil to sow and grow everything new again. In that sense, hitting bottom, while extremely painful, is also the sowing ground. Though we would never wish the poisonous red shoes and the subsequent decrease of life onto ourselves or others, there is in its fiery and destructive centre a something that fuses fierceness to wisdom in the woman who has danced the cursed dance, who has lost herself and her creative life, who has driven herself to hell in a cheap or expensive hand basket and yet who has somehow held on to a word, thought, an idea, until she could escape her demon, 
through a crack in time and live to tell about it. So the woman who has danced out of control, who has lost her footing and lost her feet and understands that bereft state at the end of the fairy tale has a special and valuable wisdom. She is like Sagua, a fine and beautiful cactus that lives in the desert. Saguaros can be shot, full of holes, carved upon, knocked over, stepped on, and still they live. Still they store life, giving water. Still they grow wild and repair themselves over time. Though fairy tales end after ten pages, our lives do not. We are multi-volume sets. In our lives, even though one episode amounts to a crash and burn, there is always another episode awaiting us, and then another. There are always more opportunities to get it right, to fashion our lives in the ways we deserve to have them. Don't waste your time hating a failure. Failure is a greater teacher than success. Listen, learn, go on. That is what we are doing with this tale. We are listening to its ancient message. We are learning about deteriorative patterns. So we can go on with the strength of one who can sense the traps and cages and baits before we are upon them or caught in them. Let us begin to unravel this very important tale by understanding what happens when the vital life we value most, no matter, no matter what it might look like to others, the life we love most is devalued and turned to ashes. The Handmade Red Shoes In the tale we see that the child loses the red shoes she has fastened for herself, those that made her feel rich in her own special way. She was poor but she was innovative. She was finding her way. She had progressed from having no shoes to having shoes that gave her a sense of soul in spite of the difficulties of her outer life. The handmade shoes are marks of her rising out of a mean psychic existence into a passionate life of her own design. Her shoes represent an enormous and literal step toward integration of her resourceful feminine nature day-to-day -day life. It does not matter that her life is imperfect. She has her joy. She will evolve. In fairy tales, we can understand this typically poor but inventive character as a psychological motive for one who is rich in spirit and who slowly becomes more conscious and more powerful over a long period of time. It could be said that this character exactly portrays all of us for we all make progress slowly but surely. Socially, shoes send a signal, a way of recognising one type of person from another. Artists often wear shoes that are quite different from those worn by, say, engineers. Shoes can tell something about what we are like, sometimes even who we are aspiring to be, the persona we are trying out. The archetypical symbolism of the shoe goes back to an ancient time when shoes were a mark of authority. Rulers had them, slaves did not. Even today, much of the modern world is taught to make immoderate judgments about a person's intelligence and abilities based on whether he or she wears shoes or not, as well as whether those who wear shoes are well healed or not. This version of the tale grows out of our having lived in the cold north countries, where shoes are understood as instruments of survival. Keeping the feet dry and warm keeps a person alive in bitter cold and wet. I can remember my aunt telling me that to steal someone's only pair of shoes in winter was a crime equal to murder. A woman's creative and passionate nature is at the same risk if she cannot hold on to her sources of growth and joy. These are her warmth, her protection. The symbol of shoes can be understood as a psychological metaphor. They protect and defend what we stand on, our feet. In archetypical symbolism, feet represent mobility and freedom, 
In that sense, to have shoes to cover the feet is to have the conviction of our beliefs and the wherewithal to act on them. Without psychic shoes, a woman is unable to negotiate inner or outer environs that require acuity, sense, caution and toughness. Life and sacrifice go together. Red is the colour of life and of sacrifice. To live a vibrant life, we must make sacrifices of various sorts. If you want to go to university, you must sacrifice time and money and give intense concentration to the venture. If you want to create, you have to sacrifice superficiality, some security, and often your desire to be liked, to draw up your most intense insights, your most far-reaching visions. Problems arise when there is much sacrifice, but no life forthcoming from it. Then red is the colour of blood loss rather than blood life. This is exactly what occurs in the tale. One sort of vibrant and beloved red is lost when the child's handmade red shoes are burned. This sets up a yearning, an obsession, and finally an addiction to another kind of red. The one of fast-breaking, cheap thrills, sex without soul, the one that leads to a life without meaning. So, understanding all aspects of the fairy tale as components of a single woman's psyche, we can see that the child's making of the red shoes accomplishes a fear, a major feat. She takes life from shoeless, slave status, just going on one's way, nose to the road, looking neither left nor right, to a consciousness that pauses to create, that notices beauty and feels joy, that has passion and registers satiation and all the things that make up the integral nature we call wild. The fact that the shoes are red indicates that the process is going to be one of vibrant life, which includes sacrifice. This is right and proper. The fact that these shoes are handmade and pieced from scraps points to the child symbolising the creative spirit, who, being motherless and untaught for whatever reasons, has pieced this all together for herself using native perception and brava. What a fine and soulful accomplishment. If well enough could only be left alone, this situation would progress nicely for the creative self. In the tale, the child is delighted by her handiwork, the fact that she could manage it, the fact that she had the patience to search and gather, to design, to piece and fit, to make her ideas manifest, no matter that, at first, the product is crude. Many of the creation gods, through all cultures and through all time, did not create perfectly the first time. The first try can always stand improvement, and the second and often the third and fourth as well. That has nothing to do with one's goodness and skill. It is just life, evocative and evolving. But if the child is left alone, she will make another pair of red shoes, and another, and another, until they are not so crude. She will progress. But even beyond her wondrous display of ingenuity and thriving in difficult circumstances, the shining fact for her is that these shoes she has made cause her enormous joy. And joy is her life's blood, spirit food, and soul life all in one. Joy is the kind of feeling a woman has when she lays the words down on the paper just so, or hits the notes al punto, right on the head the first time. Phew, unbelievable. It is the kind of feeling a woman has when she finds she is pregnant and wants to be. It is the kind of joy a woman feels when she looks at people she loves enjoying themselves. It is the kind of joy a woman feels when she has done something that she feels dogged about, that she feels intense about, something that took risk, something that made her stretch, best herself, and succeed. Maybe gracefully, maybe not, but she did it. Created the something, the someone, the art, the battle, the moment, her life. That is a woman's natural and instinctive state of being. 
Wild Woman emanates up through that kind of joy. That sort of soulful situation summons her by name. But in the story, as fate would have it, one day, in direct opposition to the simple red shoes pieced from scraps, the simple joy for life, along comes a gilded carriage, creaking and rolling into the child's life. The Traps Trap number one, the gilded carriage, the devalued life. In archetypical symbolism, the carriage is a literal image, a conveyance that carries something from one place to another. In modern dream material and contemporary folklore, it has been mostly suppl supplanted by the automobile, which has the same archetypical feel to it. Classically, the sort of carrying conveyance is understood as the central mood of the psyche that transports us from one place in the psyche to another, from one idea to another, from one thought to another, and from one endeavour to another. Climbing into the old woman's gilded carriage here is very similar to entering the gilded cage. It is supposedly it supposedly offers something more comfortable, less stressful, but in effect it captures instead. It entraps in a way that is not immediately perceivable, since guilt tends to be so dazzling at first. So imagine we are going down the road of our own lives in our handmade shoes, and a mood comes over us, something like this. Maybe something else would be better, something that isn't so difficult. Something that takes less time, energy and striving. It often happens in women's lives. We are in the midst of an endeavour and feeling anywhere from bad to good about it. We are just making up our lives as we go along and doing the best we can. But soon something washes over us. Something that says, this is pretty hard. But look at that beautiful something or other over there. That guised up... Gussied up thing looks easier, finer, more compelling. All of a sudden the gilded carriage rolls up, the doors open, the little stairs drop down and we step in. We have been seduced. This temptation occurs on a regular and sometimes daily basis. Sometimes it is hard to say no. So we marry the wrong person because it makes our economic lives easier. We give up on the new piece we're working on and go back to using the easier, but old, tired-out one we've been pushing around the floor for the last ten years. We don't take that good poem into the finer-than-fine range, but leave it in its third draft instead of raking through it one more time. The gilded carriage scenario overwhelms the simple joy of red shoes. While we could interpret this as a woman's quest for material goods and comforts, more often it expresses a simple psychological desire to not have to toil so at the basic matters of creative life. The desire to have it easier is not the trap. That is something the ego naturally desires. Ah, but the price. The price is the trap. The trap is sprung when the child goes to live with the old rich woman. There she must remain proper and silent. No overt yearning allowed. And more specifically, no fulfilment of that yearning. This is the beginning of soul famine for the creative spirit. Classical Jungian psychology emphasizes that the loss of soul occurs particularly at midlife, somewhere at or after age 35. But for women in modern culture, soul loss is a danger every single day, whether you are 18 or 80, married or not. Regardless of your bloodline, education or economics, many educated people smile indulgently when they hear that primitive people have endless lists of experiences and events they feel can steal their souls away from them. From sighting a bear at the wrong time of year to entering a house that has not yet been blessed after a death occurred there. Though much in modern culture is wondrous and life-giving, it also has more wrong time bears and unblessed places of the dead in a square block than throughout a thousand square miles of outback. The central psychic fact remains that our connection to meaning, passion, soulfulness 
and the deep nature is something we have to keep watch over. There are many things that try to force, sweep, seduce away these handmade shoes, seeming simple things like saying, later, I'll do that dance, planting, hugging, finding, planning, learning, peacemaking, cleansing, later. Traps, all. Trap number two, the dry old woman, the senescent force. In dream and fairy tale interpretation, whoever owns the conveyor of attitudes, the gilded carriage, is understood as the main value pressing down upon the psyche, forcing it forward, locomoting it in the direction it pleases. In this case, the values of the old woman who owns the carriage begin to drive the psyche. In classical Jungian psychology, the archetypical figure of the elder is sometimes called the senex force. In Latin, senex means old man. More properly, and without the gender attribution, the symbol of the elder can be understood as the, nes- as the senescent force, that which acts in a way that is peculiar to the aged. In fairy tales, this aged force is personified by an old person who is often portrayed as one-sided in some way, indicating that one's psychic process is also developing in a one-sided manner. Ideally, an old woman symbolizes dignity, mentoring, wisdom, self-knowledge, tradition-bearing, well-defined boundaries, and experience. With a good dose of crabby, long-toothed, straight-talking, flirtatious sass thrown in for good measure. But when an old fairy tale woman uses these attributes negatively, as in the red shoes, we are forewarned that aspects of psyche that should remain warm are about to be frozen in time. Something normally vibrant within the psyche is about to be starched flat, given a drubbing, a distorted beyond recognition. When the child enters the old woman's gilded carriage and subsequently her household, she is captured just as surely as if she purposely stuck her paw in a double DD fang hanger trap. As we see in the tale, being taken in by the old woman, rather than dignifying the new, allows the senescent attitude to destroy innovation. Rather than mentoring her ward, the old woman will attempt to calcify her. The old woman in this tale is not a sage, but rather is dedicated to repetition of a single value without experimentation or renewal. By way of all the scenes at church, we see that the single value is that the opinion of the collective matters more than anything and should eclipse the needs of the individual wild soul. A collective is often thought of as the culture, that surrounds an individual. While this is true, Jung's definition was the many as compared to the one. We are influenced by many collectives, both groups with which we affiliate and those of which we are not members. Whether the collectives surrounding us are academic, spiritual, financial, work world, familial or otherwise, they enact powerful rewards and punishments to their members and non-members alike. They work to influence and control all manner of things, from our thoughts to our choice of lovers to our life's work. They may also demean or discourage efforts that are not concomitant with their preferences. In this tale, the old woman is a symbol of the rigid keeper of collective tradition, an enforcer of the unquestioned status quo, the behave yourself, don't make waves, don't think too hard, don't get big ideas, Just keep a low profile, be a carbon copy, be nice, say yes even though you don't like it, it doesn't fit, it's not the right size and it hurts, so on. To follow such a lifeless value system causes a loss of soul linkage in the extreme, regardless of the collective affiliations or influences. Our challenge in behalf of the wild soul and our creative spirit is not to merge with any collective, but to distinguish ourselves from those who surround us, building bridges back to them as we choose. 
we decide which bridges will become strong and well-traveled, and which will remain sketchy and empty. And the collectives we favor with relationship will be those that offer the most support for our soul and our creative life. If a woman works at a university, she is in an academic collective. She is not to merge with whatever this collective environment may put forth, but add her own special flavor to it. As an integral creature, unless she has created other strong things in her life to offset this, she cannot afford to deteriorate into a one-sided, peevish, I do my job, go home, come back kind of a person. If a woman attempts to be a part of an organization, association, or family that neglects to peer into her to see what she is made of, one that fails to ask, what makes this person run? And one that does not put forth effort to challenge or encourage her in any positive manner. Then her ability to thrive and create is diminished. The more harsh the circumstances, the more she is exiled to assaulted barrens where nothing is allowed to grow. The separation of a woman's life and mind from flattened out collective thinking and the development of her unique talents are among the most important accomplishments a woman can fashion, for these acts prevent both soul and psyche from sliding into enslavement. A culture that authentically promotes individual development will never make a slave class of any group or gender. However, in the tale, the child acquiesces to the old woman's dry values. The child becomes feral then, moving from a natural state to a captured one. Soon she will be tossed into the wilds of the diabolical red shoes, but without innate sensing and unable to perceive the dangers. If we remove ourselves from our real and passionate lives and enter the gilded carriage of the old dry woman, in effect we adopt the persona and ambitions of the brittle old perfectionist. Then, like all captured creatures, we fall into a sadness that leads to an obsessive yearning, often characterized in my practice as the restlessness with no name. Thereafter, we are at risk of seizing the first thing that promises to make us feel alive again. It is important to keep our eyes open and to carefully weigh offers of an easier existence, a trouble-free path, especially if, in exchange, we are asked to surrender our personal creative joy to a cremating fire rather than enkindling one of our own making. Trap number three, burning the treasure, hambre dalma, soul fan. There's burning that goes with joy, and there's burning that goes with annihilation. One is the fire of transformation, the other is the fire of decimation only. It is the fire of transformation we want, but many women give up the red shoes and agree to become too cleaned up, too nice, too compliant, and someone else's way of seeing the world. We give our joyful red shoes to the destructive fire when we digest values, propagandas, and philosophies, wholesale, psychological ones included. The red shoes are burned to ashes when we paint, act, write, do, be in any way that causes our lives to be diminished, weakening our vision, breaking our spirit bones. Then a woman's life is overcome by Pella. For she is hambre dalma, a starved soul. All she wants is her deep life back. All she wants are those handmade red shoes. The wild joy that these represent might have been burnt in the fire of disuse, or the fire of devaluing one's own work. They might have been burnt in the flames of self-imposed silence. Too, too many women made a terrible vow years before they knew any better. As young women, they were starved of basic encouragement and support, and so filled with sorrow and resignation, they put down their pens, closed up their words, turned off their singing, rolled up their artwork, and vowed never to touch them ever again. A woman in such a condition has, inadvertently, entered into the oven along with her handmade life. Her life becomes ashes. 
A woman's life may die away in the fire of self-hatred, for complexes can bite hard and, at least for a time, successfully frighten her away from coming too near the work or life that matters to her. Many years are spent in not going, not moving, not learning, not finding out, not obtaining, not taking on, not becoming. The vision a woman has for her own life can also be decimated in the flames of someone else's jealousy or someone's plain out destructiveness towards her. Family, mentors, teachers and friends are not supposed to be destructive if and when they feel envy, but some decidedly are in both subtle and not so subtle ways. No woman can afford to let her creative life hang by a thread while she serves an antagonistic love relationship, parent, teacher or friend. When the personal soul life is burned to ashes, a woman loses the vital treasure and begins to act dry-boned as death. In her unconscious, the desire for the red shoes, a wild joy, not only continues, it swells and floods, and eventually staggers to its feet and takes over, ferocious and famished. To be in the state of Hambre de Alma, the starved soul, is to be made relentlessly hungry. Then a woman burns with a hunger for anything that will make her feel alive again. A woman who has been captured knows no better, and will take something, anything, that seems similar to the original treasure, good or not. A woman who is starved for her real soul life may look cleaned up and combed on the outside, but on the inside she is filled with dozens of pleading hands and empty mouths. In this state, she will take any food regardless of its condition or its effect, for she is trying to make up for past losses. Yet even though this is a terrible situation, the wild self will try over and over again to save us. It whispers, whimpers, calls, drags our fleshless carcasses around in our night dreams until we become conscious of our condition and take steps to reclaim the treasure. We can better understand the woman who dives into excesses, the most common being drugs, alcohol and bad love, and who is driven by soul hunger by noting the behaviour of a starved and ravening animal. Like the starved soul, the wolf has been portrayed as vicious, ravenous, preying upon the innocent and the unguarded, killing to kill, never knowing when enough is enough. As you can see, the wolf has a very bad and unearned fairy tale and real life reputation. In actuality, wolves are dedicated social creatures. The entire pack is instinctively organised so healthy wolves kill only what is needed for survival. Only when there is trauma to an individual, wolf or to the pack, does this normal pattern loosen or change. There are two instances in which a wolf kills excessively. In both, the wolf is not well. A wolf may kill indiscriminately when it is ill with rabies or distemper. A wolf may kill excessively after a period of famine. The idea that famine can alter the behaviour of a creature is quite a significant metaphor for the soul-starved woman. Nine times out of ten a woman with a spiritual or psychological problem that causes her to fall into traps and be badly hurt is a woman who is currently being starved or who has been critically soul-starved in the past. Among wolves, famine occurs when snows are high and game is impossible to reach. Deer and caribou act as snowplows. Wolves follow their paths through the high snows. When the deer are stranded by high snowfalls, no plowing occurs. When the wolves are stranded too. Famine ensues. For wolves, the most dangerous time for famine is winter. For women, the famine may occur at any time and can come from anywhere including her own culture. For the wolf, famine usually ends in a springtime where the snow begins to melt. Following a famine, the pack may throw itself into a killing frenzy. Its members won't eat most of the game they kill, and they won't cash it. They leave it. They kill much more than they could ever eat, much more than they could ever need. A similar process occurs when a woman's been captured and stopped. Suddenly free to go, to do, to be, 
She's in danger of going on a rampage of excesses too, and feels justified about it. The girl in the fairy tale, too, feels justified in gaining access to the poisonous red shoes at any cost. There is something about famine that causes judgment to be blighted. So when the treasure of a woman's most soulful life has been burned to ashes, instead of being driven by an anticipation, a woman is possessed by voraciousness. So, for instance, if a woman wasn't permitted to sculpt, she may suddenly begin to sculpt day and night, lose sleep, deprive her innocent body of nutrition, impair her health, and who knows what else. Maybe she cannot stay awake a moment longer, uh, reach for the drugs, for who knows how long she will be free. Hambre del Mar is also about starvation of the soul's attributes, creativity, sensory awareness, and other instinctual gifts. If a woman is supposed to be a lady who sits with her knees kissing only each other, if she was raised to keel over in the presence of rough language, if she was never allowed anything to drink but pasteurized milk, then when she is freed, look out. Suddenly she may not be able to drink enough of those slow gin fizzes. She may sprawl like a drunken sailor, and her language will peel the paint off the walls. After famine there is a fear one will again be captured some day, so one gets a while. So one gets while the going is good. Overkill through excesses or excessive behaviours is acted out by women who are famished for a life that has meaning and makes sense for them. When a woman has gone without a cycle or creative needs for long periods of time, she begins a rampage of, you name it, alcohol, drugs, anger, spirituality, oppression of others, promiscuity, pregnancy, study, creation, control, education, orderliness, body fitness, junk food, to name a few areas of common excess. When women do this, they are compensating for the loss of regular cycles of self-expression, soul expression, and soul satiation. A starving woman endures famine after famine. She may plan her escape, yet believe that the cost of fleeing is too high, that it will cost her too much libido, too much energy. She may be ill-prepared in other ways too, such as educationally, economically, spiritually. Unfortunately, the loss of treasure and the deep memory of famine may cause us to rationalize that excess that excesses are desirable and it is of course such a relief and a pleasure to finally be able to enjoy sensation any sensation a woman newly free from famine just wants to enjoy life for a change her dull perceptions about the emotional rational physical spiritual and financial boundaries required for survival endanger her instead for her, there is a pair of poisonous red shoes, glowing out there somewhere. She will take them wherever she finds them. That is the trouble with famine. If something looks like it will fill the yearning, a woman will seize it, no questions asked. Trap number four. Injury to basic instinct, the consequence of capture. Instinct is a difficult thing to define for its configurations are invisible, and though we sense they may have been part of human nature since the beginning of time, no one knows quite where they might be. No one knows where they might be, might be housed neurologically, or precisely how they act upon us. Psychologically, Jung speculated that the instincts derived from the psychoid unconscious, that layer of psyche where biology and spirit might touch, I am of a considered same mind, and would go further to venture that the creative instinct, in particular, is as much the lyrical language of the self as is the symbology of dreams. Etymologically, the word instinct derives from the Latin instinguera, meaning impulse, also instinctus, meaning instigation, to incite or impel via an innate prompting. The idea of instinct can be valued positively, as an inner something that when blended with forethought and consciousness guides humans to integral behaviour. A woman is born with all instinct intact. Although we could say that the child in the tale has been swept into a new environment, one in which her roughness is smoothed down and her difficult life is removed, 
In reality, her individuation ceases. Her striving to develop, to develop stops. And when the old woman, a stultifying presence, sees the works of the creative spirit as refuse rather than as refuge, rather than riches, and burns the handmade red shoes, the child becomes more than silent. She becomes sad, which is the expected state when creative spirit is locked away from natural soul life. Worse, the child's instinct to properly flee this plight is dulled to a nothing. Instead of aiming toward new life, she sits down in a psychic pool of glue. Lack of feeling, when it is absolutely warranted, causes depression. Another trap. Call the soul what you like. One's marriage to the wild, one's hope for the future, one's fuming energy, one's creative passion. My way, what I do, the beloved the wild groom, the feather on the breath of God. Whatever words or images you may have for this process in your life, it is that which has become captured. That is why the creative spirit of the psyche becomes so bereft. Through wildlife studies of various species of captive animals, it was found that no matter how lovingly their zoo plazas are constructed, no matter how much their human keepers love them, as indeed they do, The creatures often become unable to breed. Their appetites for food and rest become skewed. Their vital behaviours dwindle to lethargy, sullenness, or untoward aggressiveness. Zoologists call this behaviour in captives animal depression. Any time a creature is caged, its natural cycles of sleep, mate selection, estrus, grooming, parenting, and so forth deteriorate. As the natural cycles are lost, Emptiness follows. The emptiness is not full, like the Buddhist concept of sacred void, but rather empty like being inside a sealed box with no windows. So too when a woman enters the household of the dry old woman, she experiences lack of resolve. Miss my my asthma, ennui, simple depressions and sudden anxiety states that are similar to the symptoms animals display when they have been stunned by capture and trauma. Too much domestication breeds out strong and basic impulses to play, relate, cope, rove, commune and so forth. When a woman agrees to become too well-bred, her instincts for these impulses drop down into her darkest unconscious, outside her automatic reach. She is said then to be instinct injured. What should come naturally comes not at all, or after too much tugging, pulling, rationalising, fighting with herself. When I speak of over-domestication as capture, I do not refer to socialisation, the process whereby children are taught to behave in more or less civilised ways. Social development is critical and important. Without it, a woman cannot make her way in the world. But too much domestication is like forbidding the vital essence to dance. In its proper and healthy state, the wild self is not docile or vacuous. It is alert and responsive to any given moment or movement. It is not locked into an absolute and repetitive pattern for any and all circumstances. It has creative choice. The instinct injured woman has no choice. She just stays stuck. There are too many ways to be stuck. The instinct injured woman usually gives herself away because she has a difficult time asking for help or recognizing her own needs. Her natural instincts to fight or flee are drastically slowed or extincted. Recognition of the sensations of satiation, of taste, suspicion, caution, and the drive to love fully and freely are inhibited or exaggerated. As in the tale, one of the most insidious attacks on the wild self is to be directed to perform properly, implying a reward will follow, if ever. Though this method may, I emphasise, may, temporarily persuade a two-year-old to clean her room, no playing with toys until the bed is made, it will never, never work in a vital woman's life. While consistency, follow-through, and organisation are all essential to implementing creative life, The old woman's injunction to be proper kills off any opportunity to expand. It is play, not properness, that is the central artery, the core, the brainstem of creative life. 
the impulse to play is an instinct. No play, no creative life. Be good, no creative life. Sit still, no creative life. Speak, think, act only, demurely. Little creative juice. Any good society, institution or organisation that encourages women to revile the eccentric, to be suspicious of the new and unusual, to avoid the fervent, the vital, the innovative, to impersonalise the personal, is asking for a culture of dead women. Janis Joplin, a blues singer during the 1960s, is a good example of a feral woman who was instinct injured by spirit-crushing forces. Her creative life, innocent curiosity, love of life, somewhat irreverent approach to the world during her growing up years were mercilessly vilified by her teachers and many of those who surrounded her in the good girl, white Southern Baptist community of her time. Though she was an A student and a talented painter, she was ostracized by other girls for not wearing makeup and by neighbours for not liking to climb a rock outcropping outside town and singing up there with her friends for listening to jazz. When she finally escaped to the world of the blues, she was so starved she could no longer tell when enough was enough. She had shaky boundaries, that is, no limits around sex, liquor and drugs. There is something about Bessie Smith, Anne Sexton, Edith Pioff, Marilyn Monroe and Judy Garland that follows the same instinct-injured pattern of soul famine, attempting to fit, becoming intemperate, not being able to stop. We can make a very long list of instinct-injured, talented women who in their vulnerable states made very poor choices. Like the child in the tale, they all lost their handmade shoes somewhere along the way and found their way to the poisoned red shoes. They all were filled with sorrow for they hungered for spirit food, soul story, natural roving, self-decoration in keeping with their own needs, God learning and a simple insane sexuality. But they unwittingly chose the cursed shoes, beliefs, actions, ideas that caused life to deteriorate more and more, that turned them into madly dancing spectres. Injury to instinct cannot be underestimated as the root of the issue, issue when women are acting mad, are possessed by obsession, or when they are stuck in less malignant but nevertheless destructive patterns. The repair of injury, of injured instinct, begins with acknowledging that a capture has taken place, that a soul famine has followed, that usual boundaries of insight and protection have been disturbed. The process that caused a woman's capture and the ensuing famine has to be reversed. But first, many women go through the, the next few stages as described in the story. Trap number five. Trying to sneak a secret life, split in two. In this segment of the tale, the child is to be confirmed and is taken to the shoemaker for new shoes. The confirmation motif is a relatively modern addition to the story. Archetypically, it is likely that the Red Shoes is a many times overlaid fragment of a far older story or a myth about the onset of a menarch and the taking on of a less mother-protected life, a young woman having been taught awareness and response to the outer world by her own female elders in previous years. It is said that in the matriarchal cultures of ancient India, Egypt, parts of Asia and Turkey, which are believed to have influenced our concept of the feminine soul for thousands of miles in all directions, the, bequeath the bequeathing of henna and other red pigments to young girls so that they could stain their feet with it was a central feature in threshold rites. One of the most important threshold rites regarded first menstruation. This rite celebrated the crossing from childhood into the profound ability to bring forth life from one's own belly, to carry the attendant sexual power and all peripheral womanly powers. The ceremony was concerned with red blood in all its stages, the uterine blood of menstruation, delivery of a child, 
miscarriage, all running downward toward the feet. As you can see, the original red shoes had many meanings. The reference to the Day of the Innocents is also a later overlay. It refers to a Christian feast day that, in Europe, eventually eclipsed winter solstice celebrations from the old pagan world. During the older pagan celebrations, women practiced ritual cleansing of the feminine body and the feminine soul spirit in preparation for figurative and literal new life in the coming spring. These rites might have included group grieving for childbearing loss, including the death of a child or miscarriage, stillbirth, abortion, and other important events in, sexual, in women's sexual and reproductive lives from the old year. Now in the tale occurs one of the most revealing episodes of psychic repression. The child's voracious desire for soul ruptures the battens of her dried out behaviours. At the shoemakers, she sneaks the strange red shoes past the old woman. A ravening hunger for the soul life has rushed to the surface of the psyche, taking whatever it can lay its hands on, for it knows it will soon be repressed again. This explosive psychological sneaking occurs when a woman suppresses large parts of the self into the shadows of the psyche. In the view of analytical psychologically, psychology, the repression of both negative and positive instincts, urges and feelings into the unconscious causes them to inhabit a shadow realm. While the ego and superego attempt to continue to censor the shadow impulses, the very pressure that repression causes is rather like a bubble in the side wall of a tyre. Eventually as the tyre revolves and heats up, pressure behind the bubble intensifies, causing it to explode outward, releasing all the inner content. The shadow acts similarly. That is why a Scrooge-like person may amaze everyone and suddenly give millions of dollars to an orphan's home, or why a normally sweet person is capable of throwing a fit, temporarily acting like a Roman candle gone berserk. We find that by opening the door to the shadow realm a little, and letting out various elements a few at a time, relating to them, finding use for them, negotiating, we can reduce being surprised by shadow sneak attacks and unexpected explosions. Though the values may change from culture to culture, thereby positing different negatives and positives in the shadow, typical impulses that are considered negative, and therefore relegated to the shadowlands, are those that encourage a person to steal, cheat, murder, act excessively in various ways, and so forth in that vein. The negative shadow aspects tend to be oddly exciting and yet entropic in nature, stealing balance and equanimity of mood and life from individuals, relationships, and larger groups. The shadow also, however, can contain the divine, the luscious, beautiful and powerful aspects of personhood. For women especially, the shadow almost always contains very fine aspects of being that are forbidden or given little support by her culture. At the bottom of the well in the psyches of too many women lies the visionary creator, the astute truth-teller, the far-seer, the one who can speak well of herself without denigration who can face herself without cringing, who works to perfect her craft. The positive impulses in shadow for women in our culture most often revolve around permission for the creation of a handmade life. These discarded, devalued and unacceptable aspects of soul and self do not just lie there in the dark, but rather conspire about how and when they shall make a break for freedom. They burble down there in the unconscious. They seethe, they boil, till one day, no matter how well the lid over them is sealed, they explode outward and upward in an unchanneled torrent and with a will of their own. Then it is, as we say up in the backwoods, like trying to put ten pounds of mud back into a five-pound sack. 
What has erupted from shadow is hard to cap once it has been detonated. Though it would have been far better to have found an integral way to consciously live out one's joy in the creative spirit than to have buried it all. Sometimes a woman is pushed to the wall, and this is the outcome. The shadow life occurs when writers, painters, dancers, mothers, seekers, mystics, students, or journey women stop writing, painting, dancing, mothering, looking, peering, learning, practicing. They might stop because whatever they just spent long with did not come out the way they had hoped, or did not receive the recognition it deserved, or countless other reasons. When the maker stops for whatever reason, the energy that naturally flows to her is diverted underground, where it surfaces whenever and wherever it can. Because a woman feels she cannot in daylight go full ball at whatever it is she wants, she begins to lead a strange double life. Pretending one thing in daylight hours, acting another way when she gets a chance. When a woman pretends to press her life down into a nice tidy little package, all she accomplishes is spring-loading all her vital energy down into shadow. Fine, I'm fine, such a woman says. We look at her across the room or in the mirror. We know she's not fine. Then one day we hear she has taken up with a piccolo player and has run off to Tippicate's Tippy canoe to be a pool hall queen. And we wonder what happened, because we know she hates piccolo players and always wanted to live on Orca's Island, not in Tippy Canoe, and she never before mentioned anything about pool halls. Like Hedda Gabler in Hendrik Ibsen's play, the wildish woman can pretend to live an ordinary life, while gritting her teeth, but there is always a price to pay. Hedda sneaks a passionate and dangerous life, playing games with an ex-lover and with death. Outwardly, she pretends to be content wearing bonnets and listening to her dry husband cavil about his dusty life. A woman can be outwardly polite, and even cynical, but inwardly hemorrhaging. Or, like Jenna Stroplin, a woman can try to comply until she cannot stand it any longer, and then her creative nature corroded and sickened by being forced into the shadow, erupts violently to rebel against the tenets of breeding in reckless ways that disregard one's gifts and one's very life. You can call it anything you like, but sneaking a life because the real one is not given room enough to thrive is hard on woman's vitality. Captured and starved, women sneak all kinds of things. They sneak unsanctioned books and music, They sneak friendships, sexual feeling, religious affiliation. They sneak furtive thinking, dreams of revolution. They sneak time away from their mates and families. They sneak a treasure into the house. They sneak their writing time, their thinking time, their soul time. They sneak a spirit into the bedroom, a poem before work. They sneak a skip or an embrace when no one's looking. Did you... To detour off this polarised path, a woman has to surrender the pretense. Sneaking a counterfeit soul life never works. It always blows out the side wall when you're least expecting it. And it's misery all round. It's better to go up, stand up, no matter how homemade your platform, and live the most you can, the best you can, and forego the sneaky of counterfeits. Hold out for what has real meaning and health for you. In the tale, the child ducks the shoes past the old woman with failing eyesight. Here, it is affirmed that she... Here it is affirmed that the dry and perfectionist value system itself is devoid of the ability to see closely, to be alert to what is going on all around. It is typical of the injured inner psyche and culture as well to not notice the the personal distress of the self. So the young girl makes one more rotten choice in a long line of several. Let us surmise that her first step to entrapment, entering the gilded carriage, was made out of ignorance. Let us say letting go of her own handiwork was thoughtless, 
but typical of those who are inexperienced at life. But now she wants those shoes in the shoemaker's case. And paradoxically, that impulse toward new life is right and proper. But she has spent too much time at the old woman's, and her instincts do not cry out in alarm as she chooses this deadly potential. In fact, the shoemaker conspires with the child. He winks and smiles about her poor choice. Together, they sneak the red shoes by. Women trick themselves this way. They've thrown away the treasure, whatever it might be, but they're sneaking bits and pieces any way they can. Are they writing? Yes, but secretly, so they have no support, no feedback. The student, is she going for her edge? Yes, but she secretly, but secretly so that she can have help. Yes, but secretly so that she can have no help and no mentor. Is the performer risking putting out completely original work, or is she presenting pale imitations so that she becomes mime instead of exemplar? What about the ambitious woman who is pretending to be not ambitious, who is heartfelt towards accomplishments for herself, her people, her world? She is the powerful dreamer, yet consigns herself to struggle forward in silence. It is deadly to be without a confidant, without a guide, without even a tiny cheering section. It is difficult to sneak little shreds of life this way, but women do it every day. When a woman feels compelled to sneak life, she is in the minimal subs subsistence mode. She sneaks life away from the hearing of them, whoever the them is in her life. She acts disinterested and calm on the surface. But whenever there is a crack of light, her starved self leaps out, runs for the nearest life form, lights up, kicks back, charges madly, dances herself silly, exhausts herself, then tries to creep back to the black cell before anyone notices she is gone. Women with poor marriages do this. Women made to feel inferior do this. Women filled with shame, women fearing punishment, ridicule or humiliation do this. Instinct injured women do this. Sneaking is good for a captured woman only if she sneaks the right thing. Only if that thing leads to her liberation. In essence, sneaking good and filling and brave pieces of life causes the soul to be even more determined that the sneaking stop and that it be free to lead life out in the open as it sees fit. You. You see, there is something in the wild soul that will not let us subsist forever on piecemeal intake. Because in actuality, it is impossible for the woman who strives for consciousness to sneak little sniffs of good air and then be content with no more. Remember when you were a child and you found out that you couldn't do yourself in by holding your breath? Though you might try to get by on just a little air or no air at all, some big fist bellows takes over, something fierce and demanding that makes you eventually shovel the air in as fast as you can. You gulp it. Bite it down until you are breathing fully again. Blessedly, there is something like that in the soul. Psyche, as well. It takes us over and forces us to take full breaths of good air. Truly, we know that we cannot really subsist on sneaking little sips of life. The wild force in a woman's soul demands that she have access to it all. We can stay alert and take in the things that are right for us. The shoemaker in the tale foreshadows the old soldier who brings the dance yourself crazy shoes to life later in the story. There are too many coincidences between this character and what we know of ancient symbolism to think he is just an innocent bystander. The natural predator within the psyche, and that of the culture as well, is a shape changer, a force that is able to distinguish itself, just as traps, cages and poisoned bait are disguised in order to lure the unaware. 
we must take into account that he makes a joke out of tricking the old woman. No, it is likely that he is in league with the soldier, who of course is a depiction of the devil in disguise. In olden times, the devil, the soldier, the shoemaker, the hunchback, and other images were used to portray the negative forces in both earth nature and human nature. While we could rightfully be proud of the soul, brave enough to try and sneak a something, and anything, under such drought conditions, the fact remains that alone cannot be the sole issue. A whole psychology has to include not only body, mind and spirit, but also, equally, culture and environment. And in this light, it must be asked at each level how it came to be that any individual woman feels she has to cringe, flinch, grovel and plead for a life that is her own to begin with. What is in any culture that demands such? Inquiring into the pressures created by each layer of the inner and outer worlds will preclude a woman from thinking that sneaking the devil's shoes is, in any way, a constructive choice at all. Trap number six. Cringing before the collective. Shadow rebellion. The child sneaks on the red shoes, marches off to church, pays no attention to what swirls around her, is reveled by the community. Members of the village tell on her. She is chastised. The red shoes are taken away. But it is too late. She is hooked. The issue is not yet obsession. Rather, that the collective inspires and strengthens her inner starvation by demanding capitulation to its narrow values. You can try to have a secret life, but sooner or later the superego, the negative complex, and or the culture itself will hail down. It is hard to hide an unsanctioned something that you are ravenous about. It is hard to hide stolen pleasures, even when they are not nourishing ones. The nature of negative complexes and cultures is to pounce upon any discrepancy between the consensus about what is acceptable behaviour and the individual's differing impulse. Just as some people go mad to see a single leaf upon their walkway, negative judgment draws out its sores to amputate any member that does not conform. Sometimes the collective pressures a woman to be a saint, to be enlightened, to be politically correct, to have it together, in order for each of her endeavours to amount to an opus. If we cringe before the collective and, ac and acquiesce to pressures for mindless conformity, we are protected from exile, but at the same time also treacherously endanger our wildish lives. Some think that the times are past when if a woman was called wild she was being cursed, if she was wild meaning acting her natural soul self, she was labelled wrong and bad. It is not so that these times are over. What has changed are the types of behaviours that are considered out of control for women. For instance, in various parts of the world today, if a woman takes a stand politically, socially, spiritually, familiarly, environmentally, if she points out that some particular emperor has no clothes, or if she speaks for those who are hurt or who are without a voice, too often her motives are examined to see if she has gone wild. That is, crazy. For a wild child born into a rigid community, the usual outcome is to experience the ignomin ignominy of being shunned. Shunning treats the victim as if she does not exist. It withdraws spiritual concern, love and other psychic necessities from that person. The idea is to force her to conform, or else to kill her spirituality, and or to drive her from the village to languish and die in the outback. If a woman is shunned, it is almost always because she has done or is about to do something in the wildish range, oftentimes something as simple as expressing a slightly different belief, wearing an unapproved colour, small, small things as well as large ones. It must be remembered that as an oppressed woman, not so much 
refuses to fit, as she cannot fit without also dying. Her spiritual integrity is at stake, and she will try to be free in whatever ways are available, even if they put her at risk. Here is a recent example. According to CNN, at the onset of the Gulf War, Muslim women from Saudi Arabia, forbidden to drive by religious stricture, climbed into cars and drove. After the war, the women were brought before tribunals that condemned their behaviour and, finally, after much interrogation and condemnation, released the women to the custody of their fathers, brothers or husbands, who had to promise to keep the women in line in the future. This is a case of a woman's life-giving and life-thriving mark on a crazy world being defined as scandalous, insane and out of control. And like the child in the tale, who allows the culture surrounding her to press her into even more dryness, sometimes the only alternative to cringing before a parched collective is to commit an act drenched in courage. This act need not necessarily be of the earth-shaking variety. Courage means to follow the heart. There are millions of women who commit acts of great heart every day. It is not only the singular act that reshapes a dry collective, but also the continuation of those acts. As a young Buddhist nun once told me, water drips through stone. In addition, there is a very hidden aspect to most collectives that encourages oppression of women's wild, soulful and creative lives, and that is the encouragement within the culture for women themselves to tell on one another and to sacrifice their sisters or brothers to restrictions that do not reflect the relatedness found in the familial values of the feminine nature. These include not only the encouraging of one woman to inform on another, and therefore expose her to punishment for behaving in a feminine and integral manner, for registering appropriate horror or dissension to injustice, but also the encouraging of older women to collude in the physical, mental and spiritual abuse of women who are younger, less powerful or helpless, and the encouraging of young women to dismiss and neglect the needs of women who are far older than they. When a woman refuses to support the dry collective, she refuses to stop her wild thinking, and her actions follow accordingly. The red shoes, in essence, teaches us that the wild psyche must be properly protected by unequivocally valuing it ourselves, by speaking out in its interest, by refusing to submit to psychic unhealth. We also learn that the wild, because of its energy and beauty, is always eyed by some body or other, some thing or other, some group or other, for trophy purposes, or as a thing to be reduced, altered, ruled on, murdered, redesigned, or controlled. The wild always needs a guardian at the gate, or it will be misused. When the collective is hostile to a woman's natural life, rather than accept the derogatory or disrespectful labels that are placed upon her, she can and must, likely, like the ugly duckling, hold on, hold out, and search for that which she belongs to and preferably outlive, outthrive, and outcreate those who vilified her. The problem with the girl in the red shoes is that instead of becoming strong for the fight, she is off in la-la land, captured by the romance of these red shoes. The importance, important thing about rebellion is that the form it takes be effective. The girl's fascination with the red shoes actually keeps her from a meaningful rebellion, one that would promote change give a message, cause an awakening. I wish we could say that by now all the traps for women no longer exist, or that women are so wise that they can spot the traps from far off. But it is not so. We still have the predator in the culture, and it still tries to undercut and destroy all consciousness and all bids for wholeness. There is much truth to the saying that freedoms have to be fought for anew every 20 years. Sometimes it seems that they have to be fought for every five minutes. But the wild nature teaches that we meet challenges as they occur. When wolves are badgered, they don't say, oh no, not again. They bound, pounce, run, dive, scramble, play dead, 
go for the throat, whatever needs to be done. So we cannot be shocked that there is an entropy, deterioration, hard times. Let us understand that the issues that entrap women's joy will always shift and shape change. But in our own essential natures, we find the absolute stamina, the necessary libido for all necessary acts of the heart. Trap number seven, faking it, trying to be good, normalizing the abnormal. As the tale goes on, the girl is chastised for wearing the red shoes to church. Now, though she gazes up at the red shoes on the shelf, she does not touch them. She has, she has, to this point, tried going without her soul life. That did not work. Next, she tried sneaking a dual life. That did not work either. Now, on a last ditch stand, she tries to be good. The problem with being good to the extreme is that it does not resolve the underlying shadow issue. And again, it will rise like a tsunami like a giant tidal wave and rush down, destroying everything in its path. In being good, a woman closes her eyes to everything obdurate, distorted or damaging around her and just tries to live with it. Her attempts to accept this abnormal state further injure her instincts to react, point out, change, make impact on what is not right, what is just, what is not just. Anne Sexton wrote about the fairy tale The Red Shoes in a poem also called The Red Shoes. I stand in the ring in the dead city and tie on the red shoes. They are not mine. They are my mother's. Her mother's before. Handed down like an heirloom but hidden like shameful letters. The house and the street where they belong are hidden and all the women too are hidden. Trying to be good, orderly and compliant in the face of inner or outer peril, or in order to hide a critical psychic or real life situation, desouls a woman. It cuts her from her knowing. It cuts her from her ability to act, like the child in the tale, who does not object out loud, who tries to hide her starvation, who tries to make it seem as though nothing is burning in her. Modern women have the same disorder, normalizing the abnormal. This disorder is rampant across cultures. Normalizing the abnormal causes the spirit, which would normally leap to correct the situation, to instead sink into ennui, complacency, and eventually, like the old woman, into blindness. There is an important study that gives insight into women's loss of self-protective instinct. In the early 1960s, scientists conducted animal experiments to determine something about the flight instinct in humans. In one experiment, they wired half the bottom of a large cage so that a dog placed in the cage would receive a shock each time it set foot on the right side. The dog quickly learned to stay on the left side of the cage. Next, the left side of the cage was wired for the same purpose and the right side was safe from shocks. The dog reoriented quickly and learned to stay on the right side of the cage. Then, the entire floor of the cage was wired to give random shocks, so that no matter where the dog lay or stood, it would eventually receive a shock. The dog acted confused at first, and then it panicked. Finally, the dog gave up and lay down, taking the shocks as they came, no longer trying to escape them or outsmart them. But the experiment was not over. Next, the cage door was opened. The scientists expected the dog to rush out, but it did not flee. Even though it could vacate the cage at will, the dog lay there being randomly shocked. From this, scientists speculated that when a creature is exposed to violence, it will tend to adapt to that disturbance, so that when the violence ceases, or the creature is allowed its freedom, the healthy instinct to flee is hugely diminished and the creature stays put instead. In terms of the wildish nature of women, it is this normalization of violence and what scientists subsequently termed learned helplessness that influences women to not only stay with drunken mates, abusive employers and groups that exploit and harass them, 
but causes them to feel unable to rise up to support the things they believe in with all their hearts, their art, their loves, their lifestyles, their politics. The normalizing of the abnormal, even when there is clear evidence that it, it is to one's own detriment, to do so applies to all battering of the physical, emotional, creative, spiritual and instinctive natures. Women face this issue any time they are stunned into doing anything less than defending their soul lives from invasive projections, cultural, psychic or otherwise. Psychically, we become used to the shocks and aimed at our wild natures. We adapt to violence against the psyche's knowing nature. We try to be good while normalizing the abnormal. As a result, we lose our power to flee. We lose our power to lobby for the elements of soul and life we find most valuable. When we are obsessed with the red shoes, all kinds of important personal, cultural, environmental matters fall by the wayside. There is such loss of meaning when one gives up the life made by hand that all manner of injuries to psyche, nature, culture, family and so forth are then allowed to occur. The harm to nature is concomitant with the stunning of the psyches of humans. They are not and cannot be seen as separate from one another. When one group talks about how wrong the wild is, and the other group argues that the wild has been wronged, something is drastically wrong. In the instinctive psyche, the wild woman looks out on the forest and sees a home for herself and all humans. Yet others may look at the same forest and imagine it barren of trees and their pockets bursting with money. These represent serious splits in the ability to live and let live so that all can live. When I was a child in the 1950s, in the early days of industrial disgraces against the earth, an oil barge sank in the Chicago basin of Lake Michigan. After a day at the beach, mothers scrubbed their little children with the same fervour they usually reserved for scrubbing wooden floors, for their children were stained with oil globs. The oil wreck oozed a goo that travelled in great sheets like floating islands as long and wide as city blocks. When these, col when these collided with jetties, they broke, into gob they broke into gobbets and sank into the sand and drifted, drifted into shore under the waves. For years, swimmers could not swim without being covered with black muck. Children building castles would suddenly scoop up a handful of rubbery oil. Lovers could no longer roll around in the sand. Dogs, birds, water life and people all suffered. I remember feeling that my cathedral had been bombed. Injury to instinct, normalizing the abnormal is what allowed mothers to wipe the stains of that oil spill and later refer the sins of factories, refineries and smelters off their little children, their laundry, the insides of their loved ones as they best could, and while confused and worried, the women effectively cut away their rightful rage. Not all but most had become used to not being able to intervene in shocking events. There were formidable punishments for breaking silence, for fleeing the cage, for pointing at wrongs, for demanding change. We can see from similar events that have occurred over our lifetimes that when women do not speak, when not enough people speak, the voice of the wild woman becomes silent, and therefore the world becomes silent of the natural and wild too. Silent, eventually, of wolf and bear and raptors. Silent of singings and dancing and creations. Silent of loving, repairing and holding. Bereft of clear air and water and the voices of consciousness. But back in those times, and too often today, even though women were infused with a yearning for a wild freedom, they continued outwardly to rub SOS and porcelain, using caustic cleaners staying, as Sylvia Path put it, tied to their Bendix washing machines. There they washed and rinsed their clothes in water too hot for human touch and dreamt of a different world. When the instincts are injured, humans will normalize assault after assault, acts of injustice and destruction towards themselves, their offspring, their loved ones, their land and even their gods. This normalizing of the shocking and abusive is refused by repairing instant by repairing injured instinct. 
As instinct is repaired, the integral wild nature remains. Instead of dancing into the forest in the red shoes until all life becomes tortured and meaningless, we can return to the handmade life, the holy, mindful life. We make our own shoes, walk our walk, talk our own talk. While it is true that there is much to learn by dissolving one's projections, you're mean, you hurt me, and looking at how we are mean to ourselves, how we hurt ourselves, this should definitely not be the end of the inquiry. The trap within the trap is thinking that everything is solved by dissolving the projection and finding consciousness in ourselves. This is sometimes true and sometimes not. Rather than this either or paradigm, it's either something amiss out there or something awry with, awry with us. It is more useful to use an and and model. Here is the internal issue and here is the external issue. This paradigm allows a whole inquiry and far more healing in all directions. This paradigm supports women to question the status quo with confidence and to not only look at themselves, but also at the world that is accidentally, unconsciously, or maliciously pressuring them. The and-and paradigm is not meant to be used as a blaming model, a blaming of self or others, but is rather a way of weighing and judging accountability, both inner and outer, and what needs to be changed, applied for, adumbrated. It stops fragmentation when a woman seeks to mend all within her reach, neither slighting her own needs nor turning away from the world. Somehow many women are able to maintain themselves in a captured state, but they live a half-life or a quarter-life or even an, eighth, an nth life. They manage, but may become bitter to the end of their days. They may feel hopeless and often like a babe who has cried and cried with no human aid forthcoming, they may become deathly silent and despairing. Fatigue and resignation follow. The cage is locked. Trap number eight. Dancing out of control. Obsession and addiction. The old woman has made three errors in judgment. Though she is supposed to, in the ideal, be the guardian, the guide of the psyche, she is too blind to see the true nature of the shoes she herself paid for. She is unable to see the child becoming enchanted by them, or to see through the character of the man with the red beard waiting near the church. The old man with the red beard gave the soles of the child's shoes a tippy-tap-tap, and this itchy vibration set the child's feet to dancing. She dances now, oh how she dances, except she cannot stop. Both the old woman, who is supposed to act as guardian of the psyche, and the child, who is meant to express the joy of the psyche, are sundered from all instinct and common sense. The child has tried it all, adapting to the old woman, not adapting, sneaking, being good, losing control and dancing off, regaining herself and trying to be good again. Here, her acute starvation of soul and meaning forces her to once more grasp for the red shoes, strap them on, and begin her last dance, a dance into the void of unconsciousness. She has normalised a dry, cruel life, thereby setting up more yearning in her shadow for the shoes of madness. The man in the red beard has brought something to life, but it is not the child, it is the torturous shoes. The child begins to whirl and twirl her life away in a manner that, as with addiction, does not bring bounty, hope, or happiness, but trauma, fear, and exhaustion. There is no rest for her. As she whirls into a churchyard, there is a spirit of dread there who will not allow her to enter. The spirit pronounces this curse over her. You shall dance in your red shoes until you become like a wraith, like a ghost, till your skin hangs from your bones, till there is nothing left of you but entrails of dancing. You shall dance door to door through all the villages, 
and you shall strike each door three times, and when people peer out, they will see you and fear your fate for themselves. Dance, red shoes, you shall dance. The spirit of dread thereby seals her into an obsession that parallels an addiction. The lives of many creative women have followed this pattern. As a teenager, Janis Joplin tried to adapt to the moors of her small town. Then she rebelled a little, climbing the hills at night and singing out from them, hanging out with artistic types. After her parents were called to school to account for their daughter's behaviours, she began a double life, acting outwardly unassuming, but sneaking around across the state line at night to hear jazz. She went on to college, became quite ill from various substance abuses, reformed and tried to act normal. Gradually, she began drinking again, put together a little dirt band, dabbled in drugs, and strapped on the red shoes in earnest. She danced and danced, till she died of a drug overdose at age 27. It was not Joplin's music, her singing or her creative life finally sprung loose that killed her. It was lack of instinct to recognise the traps, to know when enough was enough to create boundaries around her own health and welfare, to understand that excesses break small psychic bones, then larger ones, until finally the entire underpinning of psyche collapses and a person becomes a puddle instead of a powerful force. She needed only one wise inner construct that she could hold on to, one shred of instinct that would last until, until she could begin the time-consuming work of rebuilding inner sense and instinct. There is a wild voice that lives inside of us all, one that whispers, Stay here long enough. Stay here long enough to revive your hope, to drop your terminal cool, to give up defensive half-truths, to creep, carve, bash your way through. Stay here long enough to see what is right for you. Stay here long enough to become strong, to try the try that will make it. Stay here long enough to make the finish line. It matters not how long it takes, or in what style. Addiction It is not the joy of life that kills the spirit of the child in the red shoes. It is the lack of it. When a woman is unconscious about her starvation, about the consequences of using death-dealing vehicles and substances, she is dancing she is dancing. Whether these are such things as chronic negative thinking, poor relationships, abusive situations, drugs or alcohol, they are like the red shoes, hard to pry a person away from once they've taken hold. In this compensatory addiction to excess, the old dry woman of the psyche plays a major role. She was blind to begin with, now she takes ill, she's immobile leaving a total void in the psyche. There is no one to talk sense to the excessive psyche now. Eventually the old woman dies altogether, leaving no safe ground in the psyche at all. And the child dances. At first her eyes are rolled back in her head in ecstasy. But later, as the shoes dance her to exhaustion, her eyes are rolled back in horror. Within the wild psyche are a woman's fiercest instincts for survival. But unless she practices her inner and outer freedoms regularly, submission, passivity, and time spent in captivity dull her innate gifts of vision, perception, confidence, and so forth, the one she needs for standing on her own. Instinctual nature tells us when enough is enough. It is prudent and life-preserving. A woman cannot make up for a lifetime of betrayal and wounding through the excesses of pleasure, rage, or denial. The old woman of the psyche is supposed to call time, is supposed to say when. In this tale, the old woman is kaput. She is done for. Sometimes it is difficult for us to realise when we are losing our instincts, for it is often an insidious process that does not occur all in one day, but rather over a long period of time. Two, the loss or, the loss or deadening of instinct is often entirely supported by the surrounding culture, and sometimes even by other women who endure the loss of instinct 
as a way of achieving belonging in a culture that keeps no nourishing habit for the natural woman. Addiction begins when a woman loses her handmade and meaningful life and becomes fixated upon retrieving anything that resembles it in any way she can. In the story, the child tries again and again to reunite with the diabolical red shoes, even though they increasingly cause her to lose control. She has lost her power of discrimination, her ability to sense what the nature of a thing really is. Because of the loss of her original vitality, she is willing to accept a deadly substitute. In analytical psychology, we would say she has given the self away. Addiction and ferality are related. Most women have been captured at least for a brief time and some for intermin interminably long periods. Some were free only in utero, all lose varying amounts of instinct for the duration. For some, the instinct which senses who is a good person and who is not is injured, and the woman is often led astray. For others, ability to react to injustice is slowed way down, and they often become reluctant martyrs poised to retaliate. For still others, the instinct to flee or to fight is weakened, and they are victimised. The list goes on. Conversely, a woman in her right wildish mind rejects convention when it is neither nurturing nor sensible. Substance abuse is a very real trap. Drugs and alcohol are very much like an abusive lover, who treats you well at first and then beats you up, apologises, gives you nice treatment for a while, and then beats you up again. The trap is in trying to hang in there for the good while trying to overlook the bad, wrong. This can never work. Joplin began carrying out the wildish wishes of others as well. She began to carry a kind of archetypical presence that others were afraid to carry for themselves. They cheered on her rebelliousness as though she could free them by becoming wild for them. Janice made one more try at conformity before she began a long slide into possession. She joined the ranks of other powerful but hurt women who found themselves acting as flying shamans to the masses. They too became exhausted and fell from the sky. Frances Farmer, Billie Holiday, Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath, Sarah Teasdale, Judy Garland, Bessie Smith, Edith Piaf, Frida Kalho, Carlo. Sadly, the lives of some of our favourite role models of wild and autistic women ended prematurely and tragically. The feral woman is not strong enough to carry to carry a longed for archetype for everyone else without breaking. A feral woman is supposed to be immersed in a healing process. We don't ask a recovering person to carry the piano up the stairs. A woman who is returning has to have time to strengthen. People who are grabbed and taken away by the red shoes always initially feel that whatever substance it is that they are addicted to is a tremendous saviour in one sense or another. Sometimes it gives a sense of fantastic power or a false sense that they have the energy to stay awake all night, create until dawn go without eating, or perhaps it allows them to sleep without fearing demons, or calms their nerves, or helps them not to care so deeply about all the things that they care so deeply about, or maybe it helps them not want to love and be loved anymore. However, in the end, it only creates, as we see in the tale, a blurred background whirling by so fast that no real life is truly being lived. Addiction is a deranged Baba Yaga who eats up lost children and drops them off at the executioner's door, at the executioner's house. Trying to take shoes off, too late. When the wildish nature has been nearly exterminated, in the most extreme cases, it is possible that a schizoid deterioration and or psychosis may overwhelm the woman. She may just suddenly stay in bed, refuse to rise, or wander around in her bathrobe, absently leave cigarettes burning three to an ashtray, 
or cry and not be able to stop. Wander in the streets with her hair dishevelled. Abruptly leave her family to wander. She may feel suicidal. She may kill herself either accidentally or with purpose. But far more commonly, the woman just goes dead. She doesn't feel good or bad. She just doesn't feel. So what happens to women when their vibrant psychic colours are mushed all together? What happens when you mix scarlet, sapphire and topaz all together? Ask the snow. When you stir vibrant con- when you stir vibrant colours together, you get a colour called mud. Not mud that is fertile, but mud that is sterile, colourless, strangely dead, that does that does not emit light. When painters make mud on the canvas, they must begin all over again. This is the hard part. This is where the shoes have to be cut off. It hurts to cut oneself away from an addiction to self-destruction. Nobody knows why. You'd think that a captured person would be relieved to have turned this corner. You'd think they would feel saved in the nick of time. You'd think that they would rejoice. But no. Instead, they go into a funk. They hear teeth gnashing and discover they're the ones making that noise. They feel that they are bleeding somehow, even though there is no blood. Yet, it is this pain, this severing, this not having a foot to stand on, so to speak, this no home to go back to, that is exactly what is needed to start over, to start fresh, to go back to the handmade life, the one careful and mindfully crafted by us every day. Yet there is a pain in being severed from the red shoes, but being cut away from the addiction all at once is our only hope. It is a severing that is filled with absolute blessing. The feet will grow back. We will find our way. We will recover. We will run and jump and skip again someday. By then, our handmade life will be ready. We'll slip into it and marvel that we could be so lucky to have another chance. Returning to a life made by hand. Healing injured instincts. When a fairy tale ends, as this one does, with the death or dismemberment of the protagonist, we ask, how could it have ended differently? Psychically, it is good to make a halfway place, a way station, the considered place in which to rest and mend after one escapes the famine. It is not too much to take one year, two years, to assess one's wounds, seek guidance, apply the medicines, consider the future. A year or two is scant time. The feral woman is a woman making her way back. She's learning to wake up. Pay attention. Stop being naive and informed. She takes her life in her own hands. To relearn the deep feminine instincts, it is vital to see how they were decommissioned to begin with. Whether the injuries be to your art, words, lifestyles, thoughts or ideas and if you have knitted yourself up into a mini sleeved sweater cut through the tangle now and get on with it beyond desire and wishing beyond the carefully reasoned methods we, methods we love to talk and scheme over there is a simple door waiting for us to walk through on the other side on new feet go there crawl there if need be Stop talking and obsessing, just do it. We cannot control who brings us into this world. We cannot influence the fluency with which they raise us. We cannot force the culture to instantly become hospitable. But the good news is that, even after injury, even in a feral state, even, for that matter, in an as-yet-captured state, we can have our lives back. The psychological soul plan for coming back into one's own is as follows. Take extra special caution and care to lose yourself into the wild gradually, setting up ethical and protective structures by which you gain tools to measure when something is too much. You are usually already very sensitive to when something is too little. So, the return to the wild and free psyche must be made with boldness, but also with consideration. In psychoanalysis, 
psychoanalysis. We are fond of saying that to be trained as a healer or helper, it is as important to learn what not to do as it is to learn what to do. To return to the wild from captivity, captivity carries the same caveats. Let us take a closer look. The pitfalls, traps and poisoned baits laid out for the wildish woman are specific to her culture. Here I have listed those that are common to most cultures. Women from differing ethnic and religious backgrounds will have additional specific insights. In a symbolic sense, we are composing a map of the woods in which we live. We are delineating where the predators live and describing their modi operandi. It is said that a single wolf knows every creature in her territory for miles around. It is this knowledge that gives her the edge in living as freely as possible. Regaining lost instinct and healing injured instinct is truly one within one's reach. For it returns when a woman pays close attention through listening, looking, and sensing the world around her, and then by acting as she sees others act, efficiently, effectively, and soulfully. The opportunity to observe others who have instincts well intact is central to retrieval. Eventually, the listening looking and acting in an integral manner becomes a pattern with a rhythm to it, one you practice until it is relearned and becomes automatic again. If our own wild natures have been wounded by something or someone, we refuse to lie down and die. We refuse to normalize this wound. We call up our instincts and do what we have to do. The wildish woman is, by nature, intense and talented, but because of being cut away from her instincts, she is also naive, accustomed to violence, adaptive to expatriation and expatriation. Lovers, drugs, drink, money, fame and power cannot help much, cannot much help the, dan the damage done, but a gradual re-entry to the instinctual life can. For this, a woman needs a mother, a good enough wildish mother, and guess who is waiting to be that mother? The wild woman wonders what is taking you so long to be with her, really be with her, not just sometimes or when it's convenient, but consistently. If you are striving to do something you value, it is so important to surround yourself with people who unequivocally support your work. It is both a trap and a poison to have so-called friends who have the same injuries, but no real desire to heal them. These kinds of friends encourage you to act outrageously outside of your natural cycles, out of sync with your soul needs. A feral woman cannot afford to be naive. As she returns to her innate life, she must consider excesses with a skeptical eye and be aware of their costs to soul, psyche and instinct. Like the wolf pups, we memorize the traps, how they are made and how they are laid. That is the way we remain free. Even so, lost instincts do not recede without leaving echoes and trails of feeling, which we can follow to claim them again. Though a woman may be held in the velvet fist of propriety and stricture, whether she is one breath away from destruction through excesses, or has just begun to dive into them, she can still hear whispers of the wild god in her blood. Even in these worst circumstances as, portray as portrayed in the red shoes, even the most injured instincts can be healed. To aright this, we resurrect the wild nature. Over and over again, each time the balance tips too far in one direction or another. We will know when there is reason for concern, for generally balance makes our lives larger, and imbalance makes our lives smaller. One of the most important things we can do is to understand life, all life, as a living body in itself, one that has respiration, new cell turnover, sloughing off 
and waste material. It would be silly if we expected our bodies not to have waste material more than once every five years. It would be inane to think that just because we ate a day ago, we shouldn't be hungry today. It is just as fatuous to think that once we solve an issue, it stays solved. That once we learn, we always remained conscious ever after. No. Life is a great body that grows and diminishes in different areas, at different rates. When we are like the body, doing the work of new growth, wading through la merda, the shit, just breathing or resting, we are very alive. We are within the cycles of the wild woman. If we could realize that the work is to keep doing the work, we would be much more fierce and much more peaceful. To hold to joy, we may sometimes have to fight for it. We may have to strengthen our si- ourselves and go full ball, doing battle in whichever ways we deem most shrewd. To prepare for siege, we may have to go without many comforts for the duration. We can go without most things for long periods of time, anything almost, but not our joy, not those handmade red shoes. The real miracle of individuation and reclamation of wild woman is that we all begin the process before we are ready, before we are strong enough, before we know enough, we begin a dialogue with thoughts and feelings that both tickle and thunder within us. We respond before we know how to speak the language, before we know all the answers, and before we know exactly to whom we are speaking. But like the wolf mother teaching her pups to hunt and take care, this is the way wild woman wells up through us. We begin to speak in her voice, taking on her vision and her values. She teaches us to send out the message of our return to those who are like us. I know several writers who have this glyph taped above their writing desks. I know one who carries it folded up inside her shoe. It is from a poem by Charles Simic, and it is the ultimate instruction to us all. He who cannot howl will not find his pack. If you want to re-summon wild women, refuse to be captured. With instincts sharpened for balance, jump anywhere you like, howl at will, take what there is. Find out all about it. Let your eyes show your feelings. Look into everything. See what you can see. Dance in red shoes, but make sure that the ones you've made by hand, I can promise that you will become one vital woman.